Look, guys, it doesn't take a forensics team or a Supreme Court to suggest that maybe the story of obstruction doesn't stop at Arira. The recurring theme is the medical establishment pushing back against people who are suggesting that, hey, maybe obstructive apneas aren't the entire picture. Eventually, they gave in and hypopneas were incorporated into the scoring method. But of course, that was actually just one episode of a longer story. Then it became RERAs, the respiratory effort related arousals. For years, they were saying, look, we're pretty sure that these disturb sleep. And we can even show you some pretty compelling evidence. But there's pushback forever. And now, you know, wh where I see that we are now is we're just playing that game again. It's very clear at this point that conceptually sleep disordered breathing is on a spectrum. And we may not even have the proper diagnostic tools to figure out the entire picture right now. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Or in other words, just because we can't demonstrably prove that there are additional sleep disturbances taking place because of flow limitation or because of obstruction does not mean that they are not. The limiting factor here may be our ability to investigate the matter. So while everyone is busy defining and measuring things, we can get started on treating it. And let me say too, just before we jump into the graphs, that th there isn't exactly absence of evidence. There is a burgeoning pool of literature that's centered around answering this exact question. So for those of you who aren't really sure what I'm talking about when I say flow limitation, what I'm talking about is the tops of these breaths. You can see that these breaths, they're flattened. They have little peaks to them, some of them multiple peaks, some less than or more than others. But in the end, they all share the same fundamental quality of them being abnormal. I've gone over this concept in previous videos, which you can find on the channel, but these are what normal breaths look like. Do you see how the breath has a very rounded, consistently rounded top to it? And there are no little peaks and whatnot like we saw in the last one. So the idea here is how do we eliminate flow limitation? And the concept is actually quite simple. And so there's basically two ways that you can treat flow limitation. You either just increase the pressure, but of course we know that when we get to too high of pressures that there can be certain consequences to that, like increased central apneas, aerophasia, it's uncomfortable, mass leaks, and so on. And so the other way is that you actually increase what's called pressure support. If you look at this, this is the bi-level titration diagram that I went over in the last video. I know it can look some confusing, but I just want to point to one thing here. It says right here, after you've treated all the obstructive apneas, to treat the hypopneas, the rears and the snoring, so you can just basically say flow limitation, they all fall into the same bucket to some extent. Some people are going to be like, no, they don't. And yes, of course, there's nuance to that conversation. But in the end, it's all upper airway resistance or flow limitation. Once you've treated the obstructive apneas, then what you do to treat the hypopneas, the rears, and the snoring is you increase the inspiratory pressure. So in other words, they're just saying you increase the pressure support. How do you do that on a CPAP? Well, you turn on EPR, expiratory pressure relief, and you go, you can only go up till three though on a CPAP. And although they are very, very similar, EPR and pressure support on a bi-level are actually mechanically different. Now, before you go, you know, buy a bi-level or jack up your EPR from zero to three, they're not consequence free. By doing that, you're actually increasing ventilation or the removal of CO2. So you have to be careful. And if you are self-managing here, you want to increment it up quite slowly so that you don't cause a host of new problems uh, in exchange for what may have been little to no problems. Now I just want to show you a few flow limit graphs of patients that turned on pressure support or turned on EPR or increased either of those. So here's with no EPR. As you can see, there's a considerable amount of flow limitation throughout the entire night. And then here's that same patient with EPR on three. You can see the flow limitation is drastically reduced. And this is consistent across nights as well. So here's another one. Here's a, this is courtesy of apneaboard.com. You can see that these breaths are very flat and have considerable amounts of flow limitation, which are quantified up here in this line. That's with EPR on zero or one. And then in the next one, they turn EPR up to three. And here, same patient, but EPR on three, you can see that the flow limit is drastically reduced. And you can see that the waveforms of these breaths are much normaler and much more aligned with what we want to see. And here's another patient, patient number three. This is with no EPR. You can see we have the flow limit again all throughout the night. And then here they are again, but this time EPR on three the next night. 
Some of you guys might say, well, you know, I got an APAP and the APAP has an algorithm that actually treats flow limitation. I don't need to look at any of this. And, you know, to some extent, there's some force behind that argument. But what I would argue is that the the algorithms to, for the APAP machines differ between machines, first of all. And we also know that they're, they're suboptimal. They come with their own set of problems. Let's just put it at that. The point is that th they are imperfect and the chances that they're going to eliminate all your flow limitation, I think, are exceedingly low. And look, without dragging you guys into the weeds, I read a, a handful of studies this morning, and if you distill it all down, there are EEG changes during sleep for inspiratory flow limitation. Or in other words, you know that little test where they put all the electrodes on your head and they watch your brain waves while you sleep, which you'll get in your PSG in the lab, which some of you guys have and some of you don't, and it tells you when you wake up? Well, if you look at that, you can actually see differences in the background activity when there's flow limitation present. In other words, the EEG does not look normal. So some researchers actually coined a term called cyclic alternating pattern or CAP for this abnormal background activity, which they believe may signify sleep stage instability or sleep disturbance or both. And there was a positive correlation between the CAP rate and how sleepy people felt. Big surprise, right? Don't ever forget that there's tiers to evidence. We don't always need to wait for a double-blinded, randomized control trial before we act on some information or data. And always remind yourself, you can't manage what you don't know. Try to look at your Oscar data and figure things out or ask all of the very helpful anons on the internet who love to help people out like yourself because otherwise you're just throwing darts at a dartboard in the dark. I think that's the saying, right? Something like that. You're just guessing, you know? If you're just flipping switches on your pad machine and just cranking things here and cranking things there, you're not gonna have any sort of footing to, to guide uh, what direction your therapy needs to take. Good luck, guys.